I suppose the strangest parable the Lord Jesus ever told is the one in Luke's Gospel, chapter 16. It's the story of the shrewd steward. He is employed by a wealthy man, and uh, this man has lost confidence in him and has decided to let him go. Before he's let go, however, he has access to all the wealthy man's accounts, and he thinks to himself, I'm going to have to find a way to make friends of these business people that do business with my boss, and if I can, then maybe they'll show kindness to me when I get hoofed out. And so uh, he meets with each of them and asks, how much do you owe? And, and when they tell him, he says, well, mark it down to this amount and gives them all a major discount in their debt. And, and the Lord Jesus says that when the owner found out what this fellow had done, he actually admired his shrewdness. So he obviously was a <laughs> under the table sort of a guy too, and was probably charging more than they actually owed. And so the Lord Jesus gives this explanation, and he says, the sons of this world are more shrewd in this generation than the sons of light. This is verse 9 of Luke 16. I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Okay, so, so here the basic idea is this. And we have to be careful with a parable. A parable is not an allegory, which has a whole series of connections. It has one main point. And the point that Jesus is making is this, that this man was thinking about his future. Now, he was thinking about his immediate future. And he was thinking about the resources he had. And he realized that as a steward, the time opportunity that he had to use those resources was limited. And so right away, he would act to do something to gain influence with these people uh, so that after he was kicked off the estate, he'd have a people that would show him kindness. And Jesus says, now, here's the lesson. You also have a limited time. You also are stewards of someone else's wealth. You need to use it wisely. If if people in the business world ran their businesses like a lot of times we do the work of the Lord, they'd go bankrupt. We treat it like a hobby. And, and the Lord says, look, the, the people in the world, they're a lot smarter when it comes to using their resources to their own advantage. Now, it's short term. that They're wise for time and fools for eternity. But we should be thinking in the long term and say, what can we do with the limited resources we have in the time we have to make friends of the world for God, okay? So that's the idea, because we're going to get kicked out too, kicked out of these bodies, these body houses, and we're going to have to move out. And when we move out, we're going to move into another country. And when we get there, who's going to be there to welcome us home? That's the question. So, says the Lord, <clears throat> here you have an opportunity to leave a decent tip with your tract at the restaurant. Your waitress, if she's not impressed with your tip, she won't be impressed with your tract. You're making friends of the world with the mammon of unrighteousness, with filthy lucre, as it's called. You're seeking to win over people to the gospel. And by doing that, you're going to have a welcoming committee when you get home to heaven. People will come up to you and say, thank you for inviting me here. So let me tell you a few little stories. I think of a young man, a boy in our town named David, who had a paper route and who decided that the first earnings on that paper route, he wanted to give completely to the Lord, kind of like the widow's mites. And he brought this little handful of change over and he gave it to my father and said, I want you to use it for the Lord. Well, my dad didn't feel I can't put it into groceries in my stomach or gas in my car. I, I want the Lord to use this in a way that David will get a real surprise when he gets home to heaven. And at that time, Brother George Walker, who had escaped from Cuba with 
a price on his head, dead or alive, was living in the Miami area and was beaming radio broadcasts into Cuba. My father sent to brother George uh, this little amount of money and asked him, would he be willing to use this money in the work of God? And so a brother Walker went out and he purchased, in those days they used the big reel-to-reel tapes. He bought a reel-to-reel tape and put on it his, I think it was his Easter message, and uh, beamed it into Cuba. But it was also heard in the greater Miami area. And he did something at the end of the program he virtually never did because he was wanted, dead or alive, by the Castro government. He announced his phone number if anyone from the local area wanted to call. And what do you know? After the airing of the program, late one evening, he got a phone call, a thick Cuban accent on the line, I need to meet with you. And all of a sudden, he wasn't so sure that was a great idea. So he agreed to meet in a very public place, and he met this man, and the man told him the story, how he had escaped from Cuba, coming over on a raft, I think, and uh, thought that America was the promised land. But as it turned out, he couldn't get a job. He was uh, separated from his family. He became very depressed. He was sitting in a cheap hotel room in Miami with a gun ready to blow at his brains. And while he was sitting there, through the paper-thin walls of that cheap hotel, came George Walker's voice. The radio program being listened to by someone in another room. And in Spanish, he heard these beautiful words, Come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, I want that rest. So someday, little David, who's now a full-grown man with children and grandchildren of his own, He's going to step on shore heaven. And that man, no doubt, will be ready to meet him. Some years ago now, there was a a gathering of believers who decided to build for themselves a new building for their assembly. And uh, the general contractor ran off with all the money after they had paid for their building. And none of the subcontractors got paid. And the Christians decided that they would pay for their building twice. And they paid all the subcontractors, again, with the money that should have been covered, all of their bills, in the pocket of this man, a professing Christian who'd run off, absconded with the funds. No surprise that every one of those subcontractors ended up coming out to hear the gospel there. And I think some of them actually trusted the Lord. This is, this is how it works. You know, when we're prepared to say, there's something more valuable to me than filthy lucre, than the mammon of unrighteousness. And the Lord Jesus goes on to press that point and say, listen, either you are worshiping God or mammon. Either you are serving God or mammon. And if you're serving God, then you will use mammon to the advantage of God and his cause. And if not, you will serve mammon. And it's a choice we all have to make. So think about that. You have resources. They're limited in the amount, and you're limited in the time you have to use them. But let's utilize them in such a way, whether it's by sending funds to missionaries or um, putting on a Thanksgiving meal for some homeless folk in your community, or buying a, a bus to bring kids from a neighborhood into your Sunday school, whatever it might be. Looking at funds in such a way that we can turn them into eternal riches. That's the, that's the divine alchemy, to take filthy lucre and turn it into eternal riches. May God encourage us to not be foolish, to be at least as wise as the world is when they invest in their immediate future, that we would invest in our ultimate future. And as the Lord Jesus said, make friends for ourselves through this unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, that when you pass out of this world into the next, you'll have a welcoming committee of people who were invited to heaven through your sacrificial giving.